Hello and welcome to Conversations from the Adoption and Fostering Podcast. In this podcast, I speak to Lara, an adult adoptee and psychologist, and she shares her story of private UK adoption in the 1970s. Lara discusses her views on how her adoption impacted on her identity throughout her life, and she is honest and open in relation to the challenges she experienced. Lara also speaks of her experience of searching for her birth family. And you can hear more of Lara's views on adoption and the issues that impact on adopters and adoptees on her YouTube channel, Lara Leon Adoption and Wellbeing. As always, if you have experience of adoption, fostering or special guardianship from any perspective and would like to share that on the podcast, please get in touch through the Facebook or Twitter page or email us at aandfpodcast at gmail.com. So I'm Lara and I live on the south coast of England um, in Dorset, County Dorset, um, and home of the Jurassic Coast. It's very beautiful down here. I was born um, in this part of the world in 1970 and um, I was adopted very close to birth at um, nine days by my parents who um, had moved to this part of the world from London. My parents were originally from London. And and yes, they were um, delighted. They had um, been told at that time they weren't able to conceive naturally and they had been trying for several years. And so um, my, my mother, who was under the care of um, a particular consultant gynecologist, um, was told one day that one other of his patients was pregnant and was unable to keep the child. And and so a private adoption was organised. And, um, yeah, that was an interesting... Well, in her, I mean, I obviously, they probably felt that was reasonably straightforward at the time. And the letters that I have are absolutely mind-blowing, with the the solicitors involved and um, the consultant writing to the parents of my biological mother requesting permission to sort of hand me over, that kind of thing. My biological mother was just 15. And, um, yeah, so looking at all of that in hindsight, super interesting. But, yeah, so my parents, you know, they went through this private adoption and um, I was I was brought home to them in... Um, April 1970, at the age of nine days. And so um, fast forward four and a half years, my parents then um, were actually able to conceive. We hear about this quite a lot, don't we? When people stop thinking about it, it just happens. And so along came my sister at that time um, in 1974. So I guess life was really stable. You know, that's the point. I had a very stable um, life, as in from the outside, it looked very stable. My parents worked together actually, and they um, they were in the sort of hotel business, catering kind of business. And you know, it's a small minority of couples that successfully work together and and still stay together. And they were in that percentage. They worked well together, and they worked hard, and they provided for me and my sister and we had a good stable life with holidays and all those kinds of things. And so really it was, um, Oh, and my parents told me very early, um, about my, the fact that I was adopted. I like to say now that I kind of already knew on some level and I, you know, I, I guess there are people that will sort of challenge that and question that I've heard other adoptees say that, um, but I, I absolutely have a sense that I felt like I was in a place that was not my place. That is all I can say about that, you know. Um, and so I don't know, you know, perhaps with hindsight, I was thinking when I'm able to process this. Well, that's because I knew I was told from I was told right from the beginning that that, that was the case. Um, but then no other conversations sort of unfolded around how that would impact me, how I might feel around that kind of conversation, that, that sort of thing. Obviously in school, I was the only one. I remember one time bringing up a conversation in my classroom about it and no one believed me. Everyone thought I was lying. Um, so then suddenly it became, wow, it became internalized as a dirty secret and one that 
I was lying about why anyone would choose to do that. I have no idea. But it became an inner world thing for me. That that was that was the point, I guess. Um, it wasn't something I felt I could really talk about openly. Um, even though there had been open conversation in my family about my adoptive status, the, the way I felt, the way I was starting to feel in the world and in my in my space, if you like, was very much, that was just for me. I, I didn't know how to bring that up. I didn't know where to, to bring that up. My relationship um, with my adoptive mother was was started to be quite challenged at that point um, because I had gone from being the model child <laughs> as a younger child to let's let's say the, the opposite to that <laughs> when, when I hit teen teenage years and so she we really was not equipped um, or willing to deal with that so our our relationship became very very difficult quite fractious um, and I would say and she would agree she would agree that from that point to this, it's kind of never really changed. We've really struggled. Um, she, I know she loves me and uh, that, that's not something I, I, I question really, but does she understand it? Does she get it? No, she, she I don't know. No, not at all. And, you know, even our conversations on this top, topic are, are reasonably recent, that there's no, and I, I guess, how could she, how could she in the end? But so, I started to go a bit downhill, let's say. At the age of sort of probably 13, 14, I was um, kind of acting out, like externalising, as we call it, and just sort of spending a lot of time outside of the home, spending a lot of time um, just drinking lots and sort of, you know, seeing boys and, and this kind of thing. And that's where it all started for me, that this spiral, and it was a downward very strong, heavy downward sort of trend of, of, of my, you know, being in control of my life began. And I think probably, um, I started to feel, uh, low mood, depressive thoughts, probably around 16, 17, I was well into sort of questioning the point of life. I mean, it sounds really heavy. It's no, it's no coincidence that I'm a sort of a, an existential therapist like, that's based in philosophy. And I, I was questioning everything. I mean, I was like, what is this all about? What are we doing here? <laughs> why, what's the point of it? Or why do I feel like this? And I, I sort of attempted to have vague conversations about that. But, you know, obviously those were met with some wide eyes and let's not go there. It's a slippery slope type, you know, kind of response. So I was very much alone with my thoughts and my questions. Probably by the time I was 20, I was in a very toxic relationship. Um, and that's when I was really at my lowest ebb. I, I really felt at that point that I could have quite easily ended it all. You know, I was very close to feeling like that was that was it. Yeah, that was the only answer. And that's where I very first ended up in my first therapy, around the age of 20, I think. Um, did I attribute it all at that point to, to having been adopted? No, I didn't, you know, and, and that was obviously not the narrative coming back at me either. The narrative coming back at me was sort your shit out. Like, what the hell <laughs> is going on, you know, like, and so therefore... I internalized that. I, I felt, okay, there's something wrong with me. Why am I like this? What am I doing? Why am I messing my life up? Why is it that other people seem to be able to have um, relationships that, that feel sort of healthy and balanced and longer term? And I was, you know, serial relationships leaving me, leaving the relationship every single time. I mean, just bounce, bounce, bounce. And it just went on and on and on. And um, it just... You know, it was just, it just felt like a, a massive, a massive, massive problem. And I was divorced. I was divorced again. I was divorced again. <laughs> and uh, and then I thought, you know what, there's something, I had started my sort of um, kind of studying in, in, in sort of well-being at this point, because my support that I had received, even though it's very sporadic, none of it was adopted to, Adoption competent, as we talk about now, none of these people really attributed it to my adoptive status. And I find that a lot, you know, with sometimes when I talk to people, it's that's a massive problem. That's a different conversation. <laughs> um, but 
so obviously I recognize that I have particular struggles and challenges, um, but I never really understood what that was about. Um, but one thing I did realize that was that I was trying to find myself through other people. And that happened, I guess, that realization happened um, pretty late, I would say, reasonably late in life. And I felt like, well, if that's the case, then, I mean, this the, the way I'm telling it now makes it sound very um, sort of uh, straightforward and, and it really wasn't very straightforward. But there was a connection made at some point that the only way I'm going to find myself is by being just with myself and being on my own. And honestly, that was the hardest, weirdest, um, most difficult it was like a withdrawal process and yet it was the best thing that I ever did. And so that was, I guess that lasted around nine, 10 years that time. And I emerged from that time, a completely different person. And so for me, it was no, it was rec- being able to recognize what I was doing really was, was, was the big thing was, uh, I just, I just sum it up in that way. I was trying to find myself through other people and I needed to figure out what I was feeling. I needed to figure out why I was feeling it. Um, it's sort of a cliche, the sort of um, the, the primal wound thing, but it really did change my life. It really, really did. I remember reading that book and thinking, like my whole universe shifted. I read it in three days, then I read it again, then I read it again, then I read the second part. And it was like, it didn't change what I had felt. It just helped me understand maybe some of the reasons why I had felt that way. And at that point then, that's when I was sort of really into trying to understand psychology myself. I did my, my, you know, my, my degree in psychology. And then I got really, I knew at that point that I wanted to go into therapy anyway. I'd been working in IT for many years and I felt, you know what, this, I need to do something that matters a bit more. No, just no disrespect to IT <laughs> workers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it matters in the day to day what I was doing, let's say. But for me, you know, with this sort of whole kind of the you know, journey that I had been on and the support that I had received, and, and my learning about myself and what helps people to heal and accept and move forward, it was it was um, it was a, it was a bit of a no, no brainer really for me. So that's where it all kind of ended up really with me and and so I, I think it was that period of time where I suddenly stopped being um, ashamed of myself and of my past yeah up to that point I really didn't talk about it and um, yeah I was I was ashamed you know I had been in I had been in relationships probably from about the age of 15 16 right up to this to this point and you know, that's odd. You know, actually, if you look at that, that is odd. You know, there's no period of time where I could feel brave enough, safe enough, okay enough to just be on my own for no, for no period of time. And and that for me was the biggest, the biggest thing. And I knew it was like, it was such a moment of realization. I knew I had to do it. And I just knew that this is what has to happen. So, so that was that. And then um, I was a single parent um, for for a long time and it was taking responsibility for myself and sort of going through those difficult times and and coming out the other side knowing that it was all uh, feeling rather different and I was experiencing it differently and it's interesting because you know with my with my um research it was very much based on phenomenology which is the experiencing of life and so it is an experiential thing you know it's you know obviously there's theory and there's stuff that we write down on paper but it's very much the lived experience I think that matters Mm. certainly in the work that I do it sounds like a really um a solitary life yeah even though there was you were sort of drawing people in but there was still this sort of this thread of of you feeling absolutely yeah and it's interesting because I would be I would describe myself as a bit of a loner even now um, and growing up, I was very much, you know, around people that were the, the opposite of that. And I certainly was sort of going out a lot when I was a teenager and, and that kind of thing. So whether that's just the the kind of the the things the thing that young people do, I mean, some do, some don't. But 
a lot of that, I think, was just escaping myself. Um, and uh, was just sort of, you know, I talk to people now who can't be just on their own because they can't be with their thoughts, they can't be with their feelings. And I, I guess that's, a, you know, a lot of that relates to what I was doing at the time. And so, yes, I had a lot of, my family was very sociable. People would come around, there was a lot of noise. I mean, you know, my, my dad was sort of part Italian, so there's sort of like quite a feisty household. Um, and yet I was very, these thoughts were just mine and that did feel very lonely. Yeah, it did. It felt very isolating. Mm. Um, uh, but I think also as an adoptee, you sort of, sorry, uh, I think the other thing as an adoptee is that because you feel kind of, and, and at the, the time you don't have a language, but because you feel sort of misunderstood, you learn to cope by, with your, like you become your kind of way of dealing with everything if it, if that makes sense and so i think some people go one way where they t- rely entirely on other people um which i did for for a long time thinking that was the answer to my sort of m- emotional solitude um and then other people sort of with um withdraw really and so i think you know I guess I've realised as I've aged, as I've got older, that actually my happy space is just a quiet life. You know, a few a few key friends, people that I love around me. I don't want all that noise and, and distraction and, and that kind of thing. But for a long time, it was a coping skill. It was a coping mechanism. Mm. Yeah. It seems like it's been a, a long journey, um, to mm. sort of a place of reconciliation of where adoption fits into that. Yeah. Uh, your life. Yeah, and that's a super interesting one for me because, again, I, I refer to this this person who's my best lifelong lifelong friend who says, "You, you for me, you're not my best friend, Lara, who's adopted. You're Lara," and I sort of say, "And I know that you're saying that from a place of love, but I am adopted, and you can't tip X that out." And so, for me, adoption, the way that I view it now is, even though people. It doesn't have, people don't need to, sorry, let me, let me say that again. People don't necessarily want to include that in their view of you. Like they prefer, certain people would prefer to see you as just their best friend or their daughter, let's say, their daughter. And so what that does is I feel, even though it's coming from a place of good intention, it sort of attempts to erase my truth and so for me, adoption is the sort of the, the, the trunk of the tree that, are, that is me and the branches come off of that. You, you can't ignore that that is who I am. And I am who I am because of that experience, you know, because of other experiences too, but definitely because of that experience. And that experience is, gives me the lens now through which um, I view myself and other people um, and the world more generally and, and all sorts of things. Um, so it, 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 I, it's part of who I am, yes, but it's the central part of who I am. So I don't, I'm not defined by it. You know, I'll go weeks not talking about it. It's not like I just sort of wear the T-shirt every day reminding everyone that I'm adopted. It's not like that, but it is there in my mind all the time. It, it is the, the, the central point from which um, opinions are formed, feelings are made, all of that. Yeah. It's fascinating to sort of, because you obviously, you, you're now a psychologist, you, you've got a, you know, a, your, spe- your particular yeah. specialism is in relation to existentialism, which is yeah. interesting because that's my perception of, <clears throat> of my children and the adopted people I know is that, that that is adoption is at the very core of who we are. And so yes. it's interesting that you've found yourself in this, yes. you know, this profession, this, if that's not yeah. good, but, but yes. that's what you do for other people. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. And, um, I, I was definitely sort of, I was definitely sort of called to that and I you know that sounds cheesy. I know that I was interested in it first, first and foremost, because my own experience was, well, I was brought up in this family and I feel like this. My sister was brought up in this family. She feels like that. 
right, how does that work? <laughs> so, um, and because at the, at the time, the adopt the adoptive things really come into it, as I said, you know, in terms of narrative, in terms of conversation, discourse that was happening. Um, my problems were not attributed to that in what, in any way, shape or form. Um, so I know it's a bit simplistic to say, you know, of course, people with alcoholism, people with depression, people with anxiety, there are all sorts of reasons for that. I'm not saying, you know, it's, you can't sort of backward engineer it. Most people who are adopted will have some sort of a struggle, but let's look at it from that direction. Um, but that was never that was never part of our conversation in my in my family. There was never any social narrative around that, and there was never any therapy for me um, to help me to help me explain what that was what was going on for me, why I felt. And so my state of mind, my mood, my low mood, my state of mind, my sort of disastrous relationship history, which started really early left me feeling really disturbed about myself is the truth as you were talking i was thinking that to not it it's like the elephant in the room isn't it but to not acknowledge it means that then the reasons for all these other issues is because you are just not very good at life flawed yeah well we're all flawed yes yes yeah yeah no totally i mean there was you know, without sort of going into too much sort of personal detail, as I said, I wouldn't, but there, there was a real sort of pinch point when I was a teenager, which where my behaviour was really quite unaccepted by the family. And there was, there was no, you know, the decision was going to be to kick me out of the house. It didn't happen in the end. Um, but with this knowledge now, that happening to somebody in the future, there might be a different approach. There might be a different conversation is what I'm saying. D- does that make sense? Yeah. And so my, my, uh, the net result of all of that was that I felt like a, a screw up. I felt like what, what's wrong with me. I felt like a mess. I couldn't understand it. And I didn't know what on earth to do about it, but I did mm go into therapy. My first therapist wasn't, uh, you know, as I said, I didn't really talk about adoption, but it certainly helped me. She, you know, she gave me skills and she gave me a safe space in which to express how I felt, which was for me the first time in my life that I had ever had the courage to do that. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, that's how it, it began. And sort of, so I began by wanting to understand how one person can respond in the world in the same set of circumstances like that. And in the same set of circumstances, another person can respond like that. Now, obviously at that time, I was not aware that there was a very different piece of um, information in in the mix, which was my adoption. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's like all hindsight, isn't it? You can look back now and it's, it's screamingly obvious. Yes. Yes. Um, Although I will, you know, I will say to, to, um, non adopt and I'll say non adopted um, children because adopted children the children obviously have their own backstory and their own experiences but two biological children in one family will also experience that very differently by the way wouldn't they so yeah. you, know, you know but I wanted to understand that I wanted to understand more about that and that's that's when I sort of started going down the road of psychology um can I ask you uh, a sort of a personal question um you mentioned your mother, your biological mother was 15. So you also mentioned that you kind of eventually did go and seek her out. So can you sort of explain how that came about and how that was responded yeah. to by your family and how that worked for you? Well, that was that was um, the, the, the second area where my family were very supportive. I think... Um, one thing that my adoptive mother always understood was that I might at one point want to not to, to know that. And it is very important. Um, I've got my own views on, on people who, who say they have no interest. Um, I think there are myriad reasons why that might be, but I just feel that it's, the most natural thing in the world to want to know mm. where you come from. And, and it's a human, it feels, uh, there's a research now that, that 
that backs this up. Don't ask me to quote it, but I've read it. <laughs> That's, that says that actually um, uh, genetic bewilderment, as it's been coined in some in some papers, um, <clears throat> is is actually uh, detrimental to our ability to form a coherent identity, etc. Now, obviously, my mother didn't know any of those things, but she just knew that at some point I would probably want to know where I came from. And, um, and she, and she was right. And it was around the time that, um, I was starting to really sink down lower that I thought, well, maybe that's where the answers lie for me. Maybe that's one of the areas in which, you know, where I can sort of put my energy. And it was a bit like that. You know, I, obviously I was hugely curious. I mean, physically I'm, uh, we're all white, but beyond that, I'm nothing like my family. Um, we are, you know, all the same culture and, um, ethnic group um, and so goodness you know if I had identity um, struggles you know just imagine so I think I knew that I felt very different I had a couple of um, experiences in in certain situations where my three family members were sitting opposite me and I was on the other side and it felt like that it was like they were on one side of the table the three of them and I was on the other and there was this huge gulf, like huge gulf between us for me, psychologically. Um, but the physicality was a big part of that. You know, as I said, my dad was sort of, um, hot, had a bit of an Ita- Italian descendancy and they were very dark skinned, black hair. And my sister obviously being um, natural to them has similar coloring. And so that was a- another point for me where I started to feel very different. I started to feel like, whoa, okay. I mean, as a child, my hair was white blonde. I mean, now it's gray, but... <laughs> You know, it was um, really blonde. So physically, I just felt like I stood out like a sore thumb as much as anything else. Also, our build, uh, our builds are very different. You know, our bone structure, that kind of thing. I was very aware of all of that. And I wanted to find, I had an innate desire to find somebody who I hoped would resemble me. And I think that's very common. I think it happens a lot. And it definitely was very strong for me. Um, luckily for me, my mother was, um, she has a very inquisitive, <laughs> investigative mind and she did actually pour over the electoral roll records in my local town hall for me for several hours, um, um, a week for several weeks. All we, all we had was a surname, but, it, um, but luckily it was an unusual surname and, um, and this was the surname of my biological mother. It was an unusual surname and they knew roughly sort of what neighborhood, what locality they lived in. So my mother, my adopted mother got to work and um, did a bit of a um, sort of private investigator <laughs> process. And, uh, and eventually I found her. Um, and I was, I mean, it took a while. At this point, we had quite a lot of brick walls that we, you know, because there were no, there were no records. I mean, there was nothing. My birth certificate where father's name was written, it just said N.A., not, not applicable. There was nothing on there. Um, and it was abridged versions. So it was very small. And um, we had, obviously, we had the name of her, but that was it. And so we had nothing else. So my mother's memory helped me to go towards um, sort of down that line of inquiry. And, yeah, eventually I remember getting the address finding the address after quite a lot of sort of you know as I say investigation and I drove there it was a two-hour drive and I drove there um, as soon as I had the address and just sort of parked up outside and just looked at this house (laughs) what felt like a really long time and I had a I had an I had a vision in my mind of what she'd be doing at this point you know I knew what age she'd be I thought well, this is going to be the life that she's going to have. I don't know where I be- what I base that on. I guess I base that on my sort of my own upbringing and what I thought she'd be doing. And, and in the event, her life turned out to be very different to that. Um, but I just wanted to see if I could buy her, see her. And I didn't anyway. I drove home and then I wrote her a letter. Um, and... Uh, she did respond. She wrote that she wrote back to me, and we we met up. And I guess I was probably what was I twenty five, twenty six, twenty five. 
around that sort of time. And we started to see quite a lot of each other at that time. Um, she was so close to me in age. It was kind of odd. Um, did I did I get the answers? No, I didn't get the answers that, that I thought I needed. You know, I got some, but I, I was left with a whole load more. Um, a lot of those were um, connected to who my father was. And and also, even though I saw some similarities between us, like physically we are quite similar, actually, but there was sort of, I knew that we were very different too, and that left me with, whoa, okay, I've got even more questions now. <laughs> and actually, it, I sort of, I went a bit, I dipped a bit lower, actually, after that as well. So, and then our relationship was kind of on, off, on again, off again. So that, you know, whilst it was great that she wanted to know me in the first place, you obviously, as an adoptee, you have to prepare yourself for that not being the case, uh, you know, another loss, another rejection, but you have to prepare yourself for that. And I think, you know, that was okay. I had done that. So she didn't, she didn't do that. And that meant a lot. But we have struggled to maintain contact. Um, you know, it's been sporadic throughout the years being kind of on, on again, off again. Um, and I was angry at her for a long time also because she wouldn't, didn't, couldn't tell me who my father was. And um, that felt like a massive missing piece from my life. Really, really huge. And, and it became, it wasn't anything close to an, an obsession, but in my mind, I thought about it a lot. And I had different theories and, you know, this was where, again, this is where my biological mother was good. She's very good with um, the non-emotional stuff, let's say. <laughs> you know, so she would say, right, well, you know, could it be this person? So-and-so said that in 1973, let's follow that lead, you know, that sort of thing. So she was very supportive on that front. But of course, nothing, because I have nothing. I have no name. I had, I had a first name. I had no surname. I had nothing else absolutely nothing else. And so that was a big problem. I felt that was a big gap for me. And I, I, there were several kind of, um, false starts on that. And every time I got my hopes up, it just felt like, Whoa, when it nothing, when nothing came of it, it just knocked me right back again. And I got to a point where I just said to myself, I just got to put this to bed now. I like, I just can't keep doing this. It's too painful every time. And, um, so I, I did. And then fast forward several years and I met my current partner and he was like, no, you don't need to put that, that to bed if you don't want to. And I'm like, well, I do want to put it to bed. And he's like, what are you sure? Not one more, one last attempt to then say you've done absolutely everything. And that's where DNA came in. And whoa, that's where I found him. <laughs> wow. um, and it, it blew my mind. So I have, I have my partner to thank for that. And it changed, it has changed my life forever because sadly, I mean, it's a long story, but it's a long and convoluted story. But he was dead, actually, by the time I discovered him, which was absolutely devastating. I'd, I'd missed him by five months. Hmm. I thought, you know, I've been searching for three, four decades and I've missed him by five months. And I was so upset by that. I just wanted to stand in front of him and say, I'm your daughter. Because he didn't know anything about me. He didn't know I existed. And um, that was a big shock. That was a big adjustment. But actually, since then, I have connected with somebody who knew him very, very well. He has also does have family members who, who I have since discovered who live close to me. Um, and so I have sort of managed to put in those missing bits of the puzzle also. But um, I connected with someone who knew him well and on a personal level for many, many years. And that meeting, that was the bit we drove up. We were driving up because it was about a five-hour drive. My partner said, are you excited? And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> he said, why? I said, well, because I just don't think I'm going to get anything from it. So far, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of hope that things outside of me make me feel kind of better, that hasn't worked out. So I'm doing this because I feel like I need to do this and understand who he was as a man. Um, but as, as far as anything else, no, I don't have any expectations or hopes. 
And actually it was the complete opposite. So it was good to go in like and <laughs> not having any expectations from this meeting. But I took a lot away. The similarities that I felt I had been looking for all the time felt like they were coming up in abundance through this conversation with this woman. And I don't know, that just brought me a sense of peace. It brought me a sense of um, finding my place somehow in this world, even though he was no longer with us. And, and let's not, you know, I mean, some people will say he was an awful man. <laughs> I never met him and I, I, I certainly don't want to um, form judgment on someone I don't know. There are a lot of stories the surrounding the circumstances surrounding how I came to be um, not great. And so, you know, I had to hold that in mind as well at the same time as really wanting to understand who this man was. I just wanted to, I'd heard all the negatives. I wanted to meet somebody who cared about him and get their side and get a more balanced approach. And it was the best thing I ever did. So I have a full picture I have a coherent story and yeah, it's, I'm, I'm in a really good place with it, with it all now. Yeah. I mean, there are difficulties obviously because you can't understand what it's like unless you've gone through it yourself. Mm. And so there are still people in my life who I care about who, who can't understand um, and never will, but why should they? they? They've not experienced it. So, you know, it's just one of those. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you've been incredibly honest and um, articulate. I guess the final question really is, what what do you think of adoption? I knew you were going to ask me that. I rehearsed my reply as well. I'm nothing if I'm not predictable. <laughs> Sometimes predictability is a good thing, isn't it? What do I think of adoption? Well, I think adoption is often necessary. Sadly, do I think that every effort should be made to keep families together? Yes, 100% I do. I do believe that that is in all cases the preferable outcome. But I'm not stupid and I do understand that that is very often not possible. And so, of course, adoption has to be the answer. And so... The fact that adoption will always be there and will always exist and is not about to go away any any time soon, and it's the right thing. You know, it is the right th- it's the right thing for many for many people. I think you know, if you asked most adoptees if they would have relished, or welcomed the opportunity to be with their biological family, with if that biological family were capable of of putting their the child's needs first. The answer would be yes, of course it would be. But the adults aren't always in that place. They can't always do that for various reasons. And some obviously even have that choice removed from them, as we're now saying, but that's a different story again. But I think I think that's always the number one, is that if there's support and ability you know, and ability to keep family together, that for me feels like the right thing. But secondary to that, then of course adoption. And then adoption done slightly differently is is my is my feeling on that and you know that's not to take away those amazing families who adopt they are amazing in many cases but it's about flipping the narrative for me because the social narrative um among among let's say the you know the lay person or the person who's not involved in this is that people that adopt are angels and very often they are angels but let's talk about let's talk about the the adoptees and let's give a better um, understanding to people of, of what, you know, it's not just a fairy tale. And adoptees, no matter how young, you know, nine days, you'd think they have no previous experience. Well, we now know that they do. You know, there's, there's genetic memory, there's in utero experience, there's the, part, there's the sort of the passing of, of anxious feeling, of, of mood, of, of trauma from mother to fetus, all of that stuff, you know, so let's, let's change. Not that it's, to, you know, making it into a negative. I'm not in that camp. I'm definitely not in that camp. But I do think there's a lot of uh, improvement that could be made. And education, that's where I'm at. That's sort of where I'm coming from is, you know, let's tell people stuff. They can't do what they don't know. They can't 
have open conversation with their seven, eight, nine-year-olds about what it feels like to look a bit different or to feel a bit different or to know that somebody else is your mummy and daddy. If no one's told them, that's important. So that's that's where I'm at with it all. No, I mean, that's, yeah, you've lived, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you've lived it. So, you, you know, I think your perspective is your perspective is really valuable and appreciated. Um, thank you. Lara, thank you so much for your time. I know you're going to come back on the podcast in a f- few months, hopefully, um, yes. with some research yes. that you've done, which is really, really exciting. Um, but thank you so much for your time and um, look after yourself. Thank you. And you have a good Christmas and New Year. And I'll um, thank we'll you. hopefully connect in the New Year. Take care. Smashing. Because um, well, one of the things that we talk about when um, we're trying to help people to form a coherent narrative um, about their lives is that, you know, the doing of that, the sort of the achievement of a coherent narrative about oneself and one's life is the very thing that can help people sort of adjust psychologically and find a bit more peace and sort of acceptance in their lives. So, so I think we all have a narrative and I think, you know, adoptees, their narratives are very choppy and kind of up and down and there are bits missing and this, that and the other. And I think that is often what causes um, a lot of sort of, um, yeah, just a sense of unease and sort of being a lack of inner peace, as I like to put it. And I felt like that for a very long time. So I'm Lara and I live on the south coast of England um, in Dorset, County Dorset. Um, and hope-